So welcome everybody to this hybrid uh, meeting of the um, Diverse Europe group of the Amsterdam Center uh, for European Studies. My name is Lisa Müller from the Political Science Department and together with Anas Frauen and Suda Rayapolan, I'm leading the Diverse Europe group. And we are supported by two brilliant coordinators, Apostolos Andri. Kopoulos and Maria Schneekutte. I hope I pronounced your name well. Um, and on behalf of the group, it is my honor to introduce uh, our visiting scholar, Anna Korteweg, today. Anna Korteweg is a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto, and her research focuses on the ways in which the perceived problems of immigrant integration are constructed in intersections of gender, religion, ethnicity, and national origin. She has published extensively on debates surrounding the wearing of the headscarf, the so-called honor-based violence, and the Sharia law. One of my favorite uh, works of her is the book that she co-authored with Gertje Jordekul, who you can see here, she's there <laughs> on Zoom, on the headscarf debates, published with Stanford University Press. Anna Kortweg is a regular guest at the uh, UVA, and in addition to her innovative scholarship on very topical uh, problems, she is also my ideal academic citizen. She graciously gives uh, to the community, to the scholarly community, and this is, as we all know, oftentimes unpaid labor, which we do in the evening, during the night, the weekend, and our holidays. Anna serves on various research networks, such as the Council of European Studies. She's also the editor of the agenda setting journal Social Politics, just to name a few of the examples that we see that are uh, visible. And then there is obviously the invisible uh, work like coaching and mentoring for a career scholars. And it is for all these reasons that I admire Anna Portevech and that I'm very thrilled that she's here today to give a talk on her recent work. The title of her talk is The Citizenship, Revocation and Rehabilitation of Young European Women Who Joined ISIS. So please join me in welcoming Anna Kortner. So thank you, Misa, for that kind and I think very insightful introduction. And we don't often talk about the work that we do that is invisible. And it is actually part of the work that I love. And I very much decided that these days I actually do it during my paid hours. Like I've just let other things that I don't find as important go. And so far I'm not getting yelled at by my administration. So I think I'm doing all right. So I wanna thank you for inviting me to this visiting professorship. It's been so delightful to be in Amsterdam. Uh, and to all who helped organize the event and my visit, particularly, and I'm not joking, Maria, Maria, Marie, <laughs> and the Apostolos. Um, so three wonderful, uh, four wonderful people who in various ways made all of this possible. And I also want to thank the many others who work behind the scenes that we don't think about, but this room is clean, it's well lit, it has paint on the walls, people worked on that. So just to pay attention to that as well. So today, and now I need my slides up. So <laughs> Maria will help <laughs> yet again. Great. It's great. So it reminds me of hybrid teaching this past year. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, I'd like to present a paper that is based on research funded by the Social Science Humanities Council of Canada that looks at the production of non-belonging. I work collaborative, collaboratively with Professor Kirchner Yurdakul, who is, uh, you can no longer see, I think, but who is actually online with us right now for this coming hour. Uh, and uh, she is at Humboldt University in Berlin. And we have a collaboration that is now in its 18th <laughs> Uh, and also uh, with our stellar cast of research assistants, particularly Julian Sunderland and Marlou Steppenberg. Marlou is actually right here today. I'm so excited. Uh, who um, Marlou was affiliated with the University of Toronto and Julian still is. All three of these women are co-authors on this paper. All three of these people. 
I keep doing it. Okay. So, um, what is the overarching research focus of our project? It aims to show how the politics of non belonging to European society shapes the life, lives of European Muslims. We argue that non belonging is not simply the absence of belonging or an extreme form of exclusion and marginalization. Rather, we believe that non belonging has its own logics and produces its own spaces. These logics and spaces are shaped by government regulation of borders and various forms of knowledge production that create symbolic boundaries. And exactly how these lo logics are formed and spaces are shaped is the focus of the overarching research project we are engaged in. To, get, to, oh, oh. to gain insight into these logics and spaces, we focus on European women who joined ISIS specifically on the ways that newsmakers and journalists narrate the stories of these women and the government interventions they are subject to. For the larger project, we also look at political debates, the work of human rights and other NGOs, and interventions by self-organizations of European Muslims. We focus on Germany, the Netherlands, and Britain, for, but for today's presentation, I look specifically at cases that involve the latter two countries. To provide some context, the absolute number of women who joined ISIS is small. Between 2012 and 2018, approximately 145 British women and 80 Dutch women went to Syria. A number of these women died, a number returned, and a number still remain in two internment camps on the northeastern border of Syria. These camps epitomize spaces of non-belonging, and who stays and who leaves can reveal the logics of non-belonging. By late 2021, the British government had repatriated seven children, leaving approximately 15 British women and 60 children in the camps. The Dutch prime minister is on record stating that he prefers that former ISIS recruits stay in Syria and die over there rather than bring them home. Though in 2021 and 22, five women and their children were allowed to return in order to stand trial in the Netherlands. In early 2022, approximately 30 Dutch women and 70 children remained in the camps. Despite these small numbers, the media discussions of the plight of these women and at times their children, including discussions of the state regulation that they are subject to, reverberate through European societies. Today I'm presenting the first paper on this, uh, based on this larger research project, which is entitled Social Reproduction Gone Wrong, the Citizenship Revocation and Rehabilitation of Young European Women Who Joined ISIS. In terms of the outline of what I'm gonna be doing in the next, let's say 42 minutes. I want to start my discussion of this paper by telling you two short stories involving two women who made similar decisions but faced very different consequences. After telling these stories, I will give a brief overview of our methodology and turn to the framework we use to analyze how the state's treatment of these women is justified or critiqued in the media. This framework brings literatures on social reproduction into conversation with literatures on citizenship revocation and rehabilitation. After I've laid out the framework, I will present a summary of our findings and give a brief summary conclusion. So, two stories of two separate women, based, and this is very important to us, on what you can learn from the press. In 2015, British national Shamima Bingham was 15 years old when she, together with two friends, took a plane from her hometown of London, England, to Istanbul and Turkey to travel onward to territory held by the Islamic State in Syria or ISIS. She had been radicalized online and in conversations with friends and the British police had noticed her radicalization, but had failed to act on signs of her decision to leave. Begum's departure from Britain at age 15 made headlines, but reporters and her family quickly lost track of her and she disappeared from reporting for many years. In early 2019, Anthony Lloyd, a Times journalist, found her nine months pregnant in a camp on the Syrian border. Lloyd interviewed Begum and the recording went viral on YouTube. During the interview, Begum asserted that she wanted to come home with her soon-to-be-born child, but also that things were not that bad under ISIS rule, that severed heads did not phase her, and that the 2017 bombing of the Ariana, Ariana Grande concert in Manchester was understandable retaliation for Western actions against ISIS. Her statements were widely discussed in the media, often in a tone of outrage. We learned from the media's follow-up reporting that shortly after the interview, Begum gave birth and asked for help to return to Britain with her infant. However, Sava Javid, then British Home Secretary, responded to Begum's request for assistance by revoking her British citizenship instead, leaving her in the camp. 
Some media argued that Javit was using his case to bolster his bid for conservative party leadership. Begum's son, Jara, died three weeks after his birth from respiratory illness. This was, by the way, the third of her children to die. She had two children before, uh, before Jara. Two years later, in February 2021, the British Supreme Court rejected Begum's request to return to Britain in order to appeal her citizenship revocation. She remains in a detention camp at the Syrian border with her appeal to reinstate her citizenship continuing to wend its way through various courts. She has disavowed ISIS and all it stood for. Her lawyers now claim that she was trafficked and Begum has expressed deep remorse for her decisions at age 15, yet she remains in the camp effectively stateless. And these are pictures. So the, the first picture, there are other pictures of her, but uh, this is the first picture from the interview when she was 19. That is a picture of about a year or so later. And then the last picture is from last summer. And you see uh, a visual transformation that is part of the story that she is telling about herself and that the media is picking up on. Now a different story of a Dutch woman, again, gleaned from media reporting. Also in 2015, Laura Hansen, a 19 year old Dutch national left the Netherlands for Syria with her then husband and two children. In contrast to Wegem, the media portrayed Hansen's move to Syria not as an expression of terrorist radicalization, but rather as a response to a range of traumas that affected Hansen growing up. Hansen's story gained particular prominence in Dutch national discourse in part through a best-selling book by NRC journalist Thomas Rupp, published in 2018. This book was broadly discussed in the media. And from these media discussions, we learned that Hansen was the first child in a quote unquote good marriage between a white lawyer and a, uh, someone who was labeled Surinamese administrative manager, both working for the Dutch government. When the family's second child became severely ill, they focused on his health to the detriment of Hansen. Eventually Hansen's parents divorced and when she turned 17, her brother died. According to these newspaper narratives, by age 13, Hansen coped with family trauma by turning to boys and was quickly labeled a quote unquote slut by her peers. She then tried to change her reputation by converting to Islam and pretending to be of Moroccan descent. Hansen had a child, met and married Ibrahim with whom she had a second child. Ibrahim was severely abusive and Hansen erroneously hoped that joining him in a move to Syria would help. Hansen's father Eugène then rescued his daughter from Syria a year after she, left, she went there. After her return to the Netherlands, Hansen was incarcerated in a maximum security wing of a prison for suspected terrorist activities while awaiting trial. She received a two year sentence of which 13 months were conditional while the remainder was time served. So she was released immediately upon sentencing. In the latest reporting we analyzed, Hansen lived quietly with her father and her two children, studying to obtain her high school diploma and through her fa father voicing desires to become a psychologist and work with young women on anti-radicalization. In these sort of stories, Hansen is portrayed as an example, possibly an exemplar of rehabilitation to full citizenship. In addition to the book about her life, she has also become the subject of a play while the TV series based on her story is currently in the production phase. So we look at these two cases and ask the following two questions. First, we focus on what are the media justifications for and critiques of citizenship revocation versus rehabilitation of these two women. And second, how can we understand the logics and spaces of non-belonging by analyzing these justificatory moves? For our analysis, we chose to focus on dominant national media discourses. And anybody who knows my work knows that that's my standard go-to uh, to understand things. So we did it again. We selected three British newspapers with large readerships and diverse political outlooks, The Sun, The Guardian, and The Times, to ensure that our analysis would be representative of broad political affiliations. For the Dutch case, we similarly focused on a right-to-left political continuum with five newspapers, The Telegraaf, Algemeen Dagblad, NRC, Trouw, and Volkskrant, offering a diverse range of political approaches. The UK, UK Sun is a tabloid, and the Dutch The Telegraaf comes close to that, I'd argue. For each country's case, we gathered all articles on Shamima Begum in the UK and Lara Hansen in the Netherlands for a period of 2015 through 2020, for a total of 242 articles in Britain and 127 in the Netherlands. Using in vivo, we, really meaning Marlouz and Gillian, 
uh, ran summary reports to reveal broad themes, work frequencies, and attendant patterns. And we used this initial assessment of the data to identify the most representative and substantive articles for an in-depth qualitative coding, uh, choosing 43 for the British and 27 for the Dutch case. The findings I present today come from these latter set of articles. Now, what's the literature we're drawing from? Literature shows that in media and policy debate, women terrorists are often categorized as mothers, monsters, or whores, whose, primarily, whose primary role is to have children and support male terrorists. Others have shown that women who joined ISIS are often discussed in social reproductive terms as quote unquote jihadi brides. And I will unpack this derogatory and offensive term in the findings part of the talk. And also as mothers of future terrorists. These observations dovetail with our reading of the media stories that we focus on. Yet we want to take this observation one step further and hone in on how social reproductive terminology is mobilized to justify or question what happens to these women from the perspective of citizenship and rights as it pertains to citizenship revocation and rehabilitation. First turn to how we define and disaggregate social reproduction, and then I will discuss what we mean by revocation and rehabilitation. We draw on Evelyn Akana Glenn's classic definition of social reproduction as, and I quote, the creation and recreation of people as cultural and, and social, as well as physical human beings who engage in an array of activities and relationships involved in maintaining people both on a daily basis and intergenerational. And note that this classic definition raises the question of who conducts reproductive labor, whether it's done in familial context or for pay, or for both. We focus mostly on the familial in our analysis, arguing that the familial, like the work for pay, is highly regulated by state and other institutional forces. And from this vantage point, we then argue that social reproduction has three dimensions, symbolic, material, and effective. First, the symbolic dimension positions women as reproducers of the national community through birthing new citizens and transmitting cultural knowledge and customs intergenerationally. However, racialized and immigrant women are often positioned as a priori outside of symbolic membership. State control over racialized women is motivated by anxieties about social reproduction gone wrong, shaped by fears of racial and class pollutions that have long roots in colonial times. These fears are taking specific shapes in the contemporary post-colonial era with the increasing influence of the far right across Europe's political spectrum. And as we will show, such racialized fears shape the two narr narratives that we analyze. Second, the material aspects reflect the importance of paid and unpaid reproductive labor in capitalist economies and define the embodied lived experience of all of us. We're all being socially reproduced all the time. I'm taking a sip of coffee now so I can keep my energy going. Made by a nice person at Crane. So furthermore, paid labor involved in social reproduction has been extracted from the global south and economies in Europe's periphery through migrations that altered Europe's racial ethnic makeup and that migratized societies, as my colleague Janine Dahan would say. And again, we will shortly see reverberations of this in our data. Third, effective dimensions come to the fore in literature on care work, where emotional labor informs both the satisfaction and the conflict arising from the material organization of social reproductive labor. But we don't use affect in this way. Instead, we look at how affect fuels judgments regarding the wrong or right kind of social reproductive activity. Such effective judgment include disgust, which in turn informs reprobation. The media also focus on whether women express the appropriate affect, such as a mother's love for her child in the right way. We then put this disaggregation of social reproduction in conversation with literatures on citizenship, revocation, and rehabilitation. And here I'll talk a little bit about some facts and then about how we conceptualize things. In both countries under study, revocation has always been part of citizenship law, but in the past, revocation was limited to those who had obtained citizenship under false pretenses, or who had joined foreign armies, and even then citizenship could and was reinstated. Post 9-11, however, revocation has become part of the regulatory arsenal of states wanting to curtail terrorism. Since changes to the law in 2014, 
and revocation in Britain can be imposed if it is conducive to the public good. An intentionally vague description gives a lot of leeway to the Home Secretary in deciding whose citizenship should be revoked. In theory, only dual nationals can have their citizenship revoked in line with international law that prohibits rendering someone stateless. In the Netherlands, being criminally convicted of certain terrorist acts can lead to automatic revocation of citizenship for those with dual nationality. But since 2017, a criminal trial is no longer necessary if the person whose citizenship is revoked is abroad. The actual numbers of revocations for engagement in terrorist activity are difficult to assess. Governments don't habitually provide detailed stats. Um, the British Home Office claims that between 2010 and 2018, on average 19 people a year have had their citizenship revoked for reasons of the public good. Yet others have pieced together different <laughs> numbers ranging from five in 2012 to a high of 104 in 2017. And the government has not made statistics available since 2018, even though they're required to do so by law. Dutch government statistics lump revocations in with people losing citizenship due to taking out a different nationality, which the Dutch in principle do not allow, dual nationality. The government commissioned assessment of 2017 changes to the law indicates that since then, the process of involuntary revocation was begun in 21 cases with 14 resulting in the actual revocation of Dutch nationality. And neither country provides statistics by gender or race. And <clears throat> While others have argued that citizenship revocation has become a political strategy that racializes Muslim persons, the cases of Begum and Hansen also highlight often ignore gender dimensions, which is, it doesn't mean that it's about women in this case, but it's that revocation is a gendered practice that disproportionately affects men, but extends to women when they cross certain boundaries of uh, what is considered appropriate behavior for women. Bringing these strands of literature together, we understand the state's power to revoke women's citizenship as the ultimate curtailing of women's engagement with social reproduction in the context of their national communities, or putting it differently, the prevention of reproducing undesirable citizens. In making this connection, we draw from Audrey Macklin, who has aptly labeled revocation a form of political death, and from Matthew Seat, who discusses it as an exercise in sovereign power. We also see revocation as part of the securitization of citizenship of Europe's Muslims, where the link between being Muslim and being terrorist renders people subject to increased surveillance and threat of losing citizenship status. On the other hand of the spectrum of state power and social reproduction, we encountered a possibility of women who joined ISIS, this restoration of the self suggests they need to express a capacity for engaging in forms of social reproduction that are symbolically, materially, and effectively in line with dominant ideals and practices. Now, we have a bit of a problem. I'm telling you that I have a story about revocation and rehabilitation, but is there actually a story here? Our analysis focuses on how the media draw on accounts of Begum and Hans's practices as wives, mothers, and daughters to justify and at times question why Begum had her citizenship revoked and Hansen did not. Yet, based on the information I've presented so far, you could say there's no story here. On the face of it, one could argue that the answer is simply that under international law, revoking citizenship cannot leave someone stateless. Begum's presumed access to Bangladeshi citizenship through her mother and Hansen's sole Dutch citizenship explained the difference between the treatment of two women reserved, received. However, the situation is more complex. So there is a paper. Begum's access to her second nationality is questionable. She never visited Bangladesh, has no ties to the country, does not speak the language, and the Bangladeshi government has clearly stated that they have no interest in granting Begum citizenship, and they do not see that they are obliged to, with The Guardian publishing this headline. Furthermore, since Begum failed to apply for Bangladeshi citizenship before turning 21, she is no longer eligible to do so according to Bangladeshi nationality law. So Begum's revocation at age 19 ultimately did render her stateless. For cases like Hansen's, Dutch courts have ruled that the Dutch state is under no obligation to assist its citizens in returning from ISIS territory and has left Dutch women in the same camp where Begum resides only recently is assisting a few women and their children in their return. 
These tensions in the interpretation and application of law create openings for media discussions of the rights and wrongs of revocation and rehabilitation. And without arguing for a causal link between media accounts and legal outcomes, our analysis shows that the media frame judgments about revocation and rehabilitation through appeals to these young women's social reproductive practices in gender, racialized, and class-based ways. So how does this work? First, I'd like to show how media representation, representations filter Begum's and Hansen's choices and actions through the lens of social reductions at writ large. This comes to the fore in accounts of Begum that portray her as a young woman who became the wife of Jacob Riedek, her Dutch husband in Syria, then becoming mother of three children, like I said, all deceased, and very rarely as daughter of enemy parents. Hansen is similarly described as the wife of Ibrahim, mother of the two children she took with her to Syria, and unlike a council Begum's life, Hansen's position as daughter is foregrounded in the extensive reporting on her father's rescue and her difficult childhood and adolescence. Media interprets Begum's decision to join ISIS as a desire for marriage with the wrong guy in headlines like, Begum knew well she'd marry an ISIS fighter. It's what she and her pals went to ISIS rural territory to do. Another headline describes her as a quote unquote bride accompanied by the claim, claim I was brainwashed speaking to the tension in media reporting between seeing women like Begum as, and I quote from work by Shireen Razak, duped by their men or terrorists in their own right, end quote. In accounts of Hansen's decision to join her husband and to go into Syria, Hansen is described as trying to stop the abuse her husband subjected her to by moving to a place where things would be better for them. And, you know, maybe stretching this a bit too far, but it, it's, it, it sounds like another version of the I was duped narrative. Um, persistent descriptions of both Begum and Hansen through the terms like ISIS bride and quote unquote jihadi bride line up with research that shows that dominant media portrayals of women associated with terrorism focus primarily on their familiar roles. More generic social reproductive phrases applied to Begum and Hansen like mother and wife pregnant with an onboard child further provide a legible frame of reference to the public. Importantly, regardless of whether they argue for or against Begum's citizenship revocation or for or against Hansen's rehabilitation, commentators and journalists are more likely to focus to discuss Begum and Hansen's wife, mother, or daughter than as a British or Dutch citizen. Now, turning to the three dimensions of social reproduction, how those are mobilized to uh, justify or question the the trajectory of these two women with regards to revocation and rehabilitation. First, um, Begum stories, where generally the symbolic dimension of social reproduction highlights, highlight Begum's danger to the nation. Yet, I want to start with a line of argument in The Guardian that argues against Begum being a threat and against the revocation of her citizenship, representing her motherhood as mitigating the risk she poses to the UK. No. Journalist argues, we don't know she fought, but given that she had three children in four years, it's reasonable to guess she didn't. She now says all she wants is a quiet life with her baby. Now the logic that Begum is a wife and mother and therefore incapable of doing anything other than tasks associated with these roles reflects an ideology of intensive mothering associated with a particular white middle-class femininity. It incorporates Begum into an imagination of us. Guardian readers may well recognize themselves in this ideology. In such accounts, Begum is also more likely to be portrayed as a citizen. So again, narration of us. In contrast, the son depicts Begum as exploiting the mother and child symbol to justify her return to Britain, stating, Jihadi bride Shamima Begum yesterday paraded her newborn baby for the TV cameras as she urged the UK public to show her sympathy and let her return. The symbolic danger also comes to the fore in these persistent references to jihadi bread. And the word jihadi does a lot of work. Its Arabic meaning is simply struggle, often associated with the struggle to achieve insight into religious text and practice. In the current context, however, it has been co-opted across a wide political spectrum to mobilize people in various ways. For today's purposes, I wanna focus on how its usage in European media together with the word bride, evokes ideas of dangerous foreign influence. This usage, usage echoes a history across Europe and North America in which women lost their citizenship when marrying foreign men, or a history of questioning whether women are capable of having allegiance to their natal citizenship when they marry across borders. 
Furthermore, the modifier jihadi erases the husband in question and suggests that Begum has wedded herself to a particular Islamic ideology. Her husband re-enters as the embodiment of threat and arguments that if Begum and her ch child were allowed to return, she could apply for family reunification. It is feared he might try to join her in the UK if she is allowed back using family unification rights. In these accounts of Begum's motherhood and marriage then, the symbolic value of social reproduction creates a continuum of safe versus dangerous practices along racialized, gendered, and at times class-based lines. With Begum ending up mainly on the end of these continua that renders her undeserving of citizenship. How does this compare to Hansen's treatment in India? As in the case of Begum, some of the accounts of Hansen's experiences symbolically reinforce racialized, gendered, and class-based understandings of social reproduction that position her as threat to the nation. At the time of Hansen's trial, the Telegraph focuses on Ministry of Justice accounts that Hansen may have been sent back by ISIS on a terror mission. The Telegraph then accused, echoes British reporting on Begum stating, Jihadi bride Laura H is again in court today. Is she a terror wolf in sheep's clothing or a willless victim? Yet, while Hansen is referred to as Jihadi bride or even Jihadi girl by these papers, the symbolism of wife threatening the reproduction of the nation does not stick as it did for Begum. Rather than seeing Hansen as unworthy of citizenship, media stories center on Hansen's experiences as adolescent daughter who becomes a wife and mother in her failed attempts to address childhood and adolescent trauma. Hansen is positioned as victim, not as a potential perpetrator. Media do not describe her as an adult making choices that undermine the nation state as happened to Begum, who I wanna emphasize was four years younger and unlike Hansen legally a child when she moved to Syria. Ruth's book is critical in this regard. In a review of the book, the Telegraph writes, the tragedy begins when the half Syrian Laura H, 1995, enters puberty. She gets into a whirlwind of problems, youth care, running away, abortion. The misery is complete when she falls into the hands of a lover boy. The whole of Zutramir knows that they have to be with Laura if they want to get some. This is also one of the very few explicit mentions of Hansen as biracial. And it gives us an interesting glimpse of on the racialization that happens under, under this symbolic dimension. Hansen's being biracial is fixed to her victimhood, which we can read from the quote, fall into the hands of a lover boy. That term in turn refers to men who seduce and then prostitute underage girls, which literature shows is often associated with immigrants and racial ethnic minorities. Similarly, Trial describes Hansen as, deflowered in seventh grade by a Moroccan boy, part of the horrific custom that Moroccan boys in particular make of her. Through such accounts, blame for Hansen's action, actions is placed on racialized groups within Dutch society were furthermore portrayed as foreign through the persistent use of the adjective Moroccan. They're actually second and third generation Dutch citizens, most likely. And connecting violence to these quote unquote Moroccan Dutch boys portrays them as improperly socialized threats to the nation of rendering Hansen, who is half Surinamese, innocent. These symbolic dimensions also communicate particular racialized patriarchal interpretations of the role of men in the social reproduction of women. Hansen's choices were shaped by her subjective experiences of victim of racialized men, first the lover boys, then her violent husband, who symbolized threats to the nation. By contrast, the media herald the role of her white father, aided by white journalist Ruth, as they promote Hansen's full membership in Dutch society. From the symbolic perspective then, Begum and Hansen's stories perform the same racializing narrative that position Muslims as threat to the nation. But where Begum embodies that threat, Hansen is portrayed as a victim of it. And now turn to the material that the mention of social reproduction in these media accounts. We see that in Begum's case, the materiality of social reproduction comes to the fore in the Times account of why Begum and her two friends went to Syria in the first place. The Bethnal Green girls knew that under ISIS, they would have kudos as wives of fighters, even more later as widows of martyrs, mothers of cubs of the caliphate, they would be granted special privileges, housed and fed free. This articulation reveals specific intersecting gender, race and class politics around the materiality of social reproduction. The term Bethnal Green Girl signifies a specific working class immigrant neighborhood in London with the majority of its contemporary population of Bangladeshi descent. 
The girls move to Syria, delineates what I read as an implicit career choice to become wives of fighters, widows of martyrs. The use of the ISIS phrase, cubs of the caliphate, to describe their children connects with housed and fed free to focus the reader onto racialized renditions of state dependency as analyzed by people such as Umar Darrell in her work. Similarly, editorials in The Sun predicted that Begum, then still pregnant, would rely on the National Health Service to look after her family, further arguing that she, and I quote, wants the taxpayers to look after her and her baby in a piece entitled, The Sun Says, Keep Jihadi Bride Shamima Begum Out of Britain. These accounts of the material aspects of social reproduction, Judge Begum is undeserving state, attempts, state support in her attempts to return home. In Hansen's case, accounts of her middle-class background as daughter of a quote-unquote good family predominate. A reporter for the Tau writes that Hansen was not an at-risk youth initially, meaning that she was not born into a family that already existed on the margins of society. And here, research by Saskia Bonjour and Jan Davidak has shown that Dutch working class racialized families are the targets of blame for failed immigrant integration in the Netherlands. And Umadero makes a similar argument for the UK. These class-based material aspects of Hansen's social reproduction appear across the newspapers. For example, the Tilakhaf right states, many Syria goers come from disadvantaged families, but not Laura. Her Dutch father plays in a band and has a good job as a personnel manager. He, he is someone who is not afraid to stand up for his children. So here the material intersects with the symbolic. Note the modifier Dutch applied to Hansen's father and extend, by extension to Hansen herself which suggests that the disadvantaged who produce Syria goers, presumably, do not legitimately, legitimately belong to the Dutch nation state. The effective dimension of social reproduction shows in judgments of Begum's emotional state as mother, as well as in reporters' accounts of their own affect. Anthony Lloyd, the Times journalist who located Begum in 2019, admits to feeling guilty that his initial reporting appeared to inform the revocation decision. In later reporting, he depicts Begum as a desperate mother who grappled to persuade her country to take her back so as to save her life, the life of her last surviving child. Lloyd then describes his guilt, his feelings of guilt, about not contextualizing Begum's initial interview with him. Within the camp, women policed each other for proper allegiance to ISIS ideology, meaning that Begum could not speak freely in her interview with Lloyd. To make amends, Lloyd portrays Begum's plea to return as the appropriate affect of a mother who desires to protect her unborn child. Yet the damage had been done, and the original reporting by Lloyd, and two days later by British Sky TV, inspired outrage about Begum's deficient affect. One op-ed in the Sun argued, I feel desperately sorry for her unborn child. And if Begum had expressed even a modicum of regret, then perhaps I would think differently. But how can we be 100% sure she no longer poses any threat if she won't renounce terrorism? If she isn't able or willing to change, how can we help her? This reporter performs culturally appropriate affect for unborn children and then interprets Begum remorselessness or the signs of her remorselessness as signaling potential threats to the nation. Again, judging that Begum has no right to return. And I am very struck by the 100% sure in that quote, because that if that's the bar we set, nobody can ever be judged worthy of anything because we can never be 100% sure pretty much of anything, right? So what happens to Lara? In Hansen's case, the effective dementia is mobilized in accounts of her social reproduction's daughter with her mother arguing that Hansen may never have been able to handle the blow of her brother's death properly, which resulted in her being brainwashed by her husband. Readers also are also invited to feel for Hansen's wife from the description of trauma she suffered during her time in Syria. <laughs> so, and this is a, uh, this quote is fairly graphic, so heads up. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, reporting what Hansen connecting with her dad while she's in Syria. Hansen said that Ibrahim was violent, so aggressive that he destroyed the television and the phones. She wanted to go to the caliphate with him, hoping the rapes and beatings would stop. His mothers and brothers would not allow that. She came home from a rude awakening he kept hitting. She told her father she was going to request a divorce at the ISIS court. 
the detail with which journalists described the intimate partner violence acted out against Hansen, and this is one of many quotes in that regard, elicits strong empathy for her plight. Through such accounts, Hansen's decision to go to Syria is made understandable by the harm she endured as daughter and then wife, and her victimhood become the becomes the foundation for the media's justification of her rehabilitation. In an Adea article, Hansen's father, Eugène, recounts how, quote, unquote, proud he is of his daughter, who is now attending school, desiring to study, quote, unquote, applied psychology with the goal of helping vulnerable women. He highlights her what he calls recovering. In Syria, Laura found the strength she could not reach in the Netherlands. She talks to psychologists every week, works on herself. Ms. Goodman argues, rehabilitation in a neoliberal context requires the work on the self that Hansen performs in this quote. Hansen is now learning to be a good citizen, something she failed to do as an adolescent, and these accounts render her an acceptable Dutch national. So, conclusion. So this paper, as I said, is one part of a book project in which we will investigate how journalists and other knowledge producers delineate the spaces of non-belonging that women like Begum are relegated to and how the logics they mobilize are different or not from those applied to women like Hansen who can return home. Our analysis of these specific cases of Begum and Hansen show how we can read the justifications for and questioning of citizenship replication and rehabilitation through the lens of social reproduction's three dimensions. These are dimensions in turn are refracted through gender, race, and class. And indeed our analysis suggests that the ways in which class gives meaning to gender and race makes a critical difference in how these media discuss the two cases. Once Hansen can travel back home, she gets sucked into the machinery of prison and rehabilitation that matches her status as the white and child of highly educated, successful parents. Seen as a good mother to her children and a contributing citizen who is depicted as wanting to help de-radicalize Dutch society, Hansen's social reproductive labor is encouraged. By contrast, Begum is the eternal immigrant, never fully arriving on British soil, always vulnerable to a revocation of status, while her children are portrayed as quote unquote cubs of the caliphate. This discourse surrounding both cases is reflective of the larger gendered racialized and class-based processes defining the meaning of citizenship for Europeans, Muslims in contemporary European nation states. So we argue. So this picture, so this is an image of uh, Begum interviewed, being interviewed by the BBC in the fall of last year. And the other picture is actually not of Lara H, but of the actress who played her in the play based on her life. So thank you so much for your attention and I'm happy to entertain questions. I hope you have. Around 45 minutes left for questions. This oh, is good. Yeah, you did I was really fantastic. trying hard not to do the aside that I often do. I hope that, that works. I'm going to grab it. So the floor is yours. Oh, you uh, to let's that. engage in a discussion, those questions. Please introduce yourself. Clana, please cover. Sorry. Maturity. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Um, go fire away. I yeah. I yeah. was wondering, and this is exemplified by you using the picture of the, of the theater play, which yeah. I've also seen. Ah, Maybe you could speculate because I'm sure, as I said, we reach this particular project. Yeah. Could you speculate a little bit about the role of this one male, white, etc., journalist? who was so central in, I think, the narrative or the discourse yeah. about Laura H and how that might also inform all the other media that you have, oh, yeah. I, I assume. Yeah. Because at least for me as, a, as an outsider and oh, a yeah. reader, yeah. for me, he is like, the, he is now the one telling her story. And how does that change what you just said, basically? <laughs> it doesn't, I actually, I guess. I mean, I think we, we, we do highlight his role and very, it's very much the case that so there's, the, her story comes up when she's like rescued by her dad because it's this heroic rescue, right? Uh, so that, that's how the story comes up and then Rube somehow gets in with her and, and gets to, to interview her. He's not actually a specialist on the area or anything like that. He's just, you know, I'm dying to interview him. So if anybody has connections, let me know. Uh, and, you know, eventually I'll stalk him and I'll figure that out. But, um, 
No, I think it's absolutely part of the story. And it's, it's um, but he had to have these ingredients. And it's these ingredients that get activated, like the ones that we described. So I don't see this as all the journalists have sort of hive mind and they all decide to do it this way. It is more that this is the story that comes on their path. You know, and then they all need to review this book because it gets all this like, you know, publicity and it's this big thing, like to the point my mother actually, you know, who's not a scholar or academic at all, she's like, you know, I, I read a really amazing book. <laughs> and Laura H, Laura has, it's just like, now I know she really was, we really don't need to worry about her. Like that was her take home, right? So, but you have to have the ingredients for that story or, and be willing to tell it in that way, right? So now I absolutely, he's a critical player. And that, you know, but, but such a critical player does still need the ingredients. So that's how I, I sort of understand it. Okay, thank you, Sarah, PhD yeah, candidate. Yeah. Yay! Yeah. Political science department. Oh. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Samara. I'm a PhD as a candidate in Belgium. I want to work on um, <laughs> questions of admission and integration, but also of dematerialization. Yeah, yeah, so I'm very yeah. Very interested cool. in this topic. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit, maybe, on how the children actually are portrayed. So I see these are two cases that, in a way, are quite clear and played out in media what is the way that they're portrayed and how we are yeah. supposed to see them. But of course there have been some recent changes also legally and that actually some of the mothers and children have been repatriated, yeah. for example, to the Netherlands. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on what happens there. So I could see that yeah. maybe the story of the mothers that say still is in a way that they chose to leave, to yep. leave society behind and maybe therefore rightfully uh, in between brackets are not to be portrayed as citizens. Not to say that they agree, yeah. there's a specific... Yeah, yeah. no, there's an idea of choice. And, because and then so. how about the children? Did you find something in the research that these children are being more, let's so, say, reclaimed as rightful citizens or are they still being pushed out as non-belonging as well? It's, yeah, uh, not really. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're a very gray area. Um, it's everybody kind of on this political spectrum kind of agrees, yes, the children are innocent, but, and everybody kind of has a different but. Like, if you bring the children back, then there's going to be issues of family reunification. Um, there's a really gray area around the age of the children. Uh, so, usually, if they're three or four, it's fine. Um, but then, once they reach the age kind of between like nine and 12, they're dangerous. They've been sort of um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Is that gendered as well? Like our boys seem more dangerous. Uh, I don't see a lot of that. It's not explicit, okay. yeah. but in the, the script, I, I would venture actually not, because there is a sense of the women as well. There's a, as there, you know, there is also a, a, narr a narrative strand of, of the women claiming to have been housewives, right? But then that they might have been part of the, the, the um, morale of the police and so on. So women are, yeah, yeah. They kind of push a narrative like, yes, these children are innocent and they shouldn't be blamed for their parents' decisions, but they are still tied to their parents very strongly. Um, even though everybody says they're innocent, it doesn't. Uh, look like that and kind of the yeah, actions that we're taking. Um, the children are worth the risk mm -hmm. that bring them back to cause. Yeah. I mean, it's just yeah. Kind of, so it's very just so are they then portrayed as, for example, innocent Dutch and innocent uh, UK citizens that in that sense should be rescued and dangerous IS children? Like is there also such a sort of nationality symbolic replication happening? They are very much referred to, uh, I read mostly Dutch uh, parliamentary uh, discussions. They are mostly referred to as Dutch children. And mm -hmm. they are said like, yes, they're Dutch children they have the right to come back, but. but yeah. Did you have a two finger or a follow-up? Mm -hmm. Okay, then, and then you did. Okay, your <laughs> follow-up. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, bonjour, I work in the political science department. So, follow up on the last question, but do you, this is completely speculative, but do you think it, matters that your children, that Bing's children die. So that she is, in that sense, I don't know if, if this is the right way to put it, but she's no longer a mother. 
Oh. Well, I actually just had an interview with somebody yesterday who basically said that, yes. But I think, to be honest, um, and do they see it as her fault? That the child died? Yeah. No, 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 no. That is not the sense I get, but I get not not explicitly, not like you, you know, particularly that third child, because it's very clear. There were three weeks where that child could have been repatriated. It could have absolutely, there was really nothing to preventing that, except for lack of blood. So that's a very deliberate decision to leave that newborn in a camp that people knew had no resources. He died of pneumonia and she sat by the kid all night. Anyways, don't get me started. It's really sad. It's absolutely preventable. It was very clear in the media as well that that child had UK citizenship, but this is the issue with children's citizenship. It always runs through an intermediary. A one week old cannot write to anybody or make a phone call, right? So it's that, um, and, and uh, yeah, what Marnus was, was also saying that um, there isn't, um, there's a lack of political will to uh, assist these children. The, the Dutch Supreme Court basically decided that the, uh, because this was a case brought uh, on behalf of 23 mothers and their children who wanted assistance and, uh, based on grounds of uh, European Convention rights. And the court basically decided that uh, while their convention rights were um, breached, while they were, you know, the, the situation they found themselves in was dire and amounted to, you know, violations of the convention, that at the same time, in part because they had placed themselves in that situation voluntarily, the Dutch state had no obligation to ensure access to their rights. So, um, and the, you know, and then there's a whole other piece to this that I'm just starting to puzzle about because the space in which these children find themselves. So there's a, the, there's an NGO in Britain, the Research and Security Council Institute that put out a report not too, about two years ago that, that calls these camps, the Europe's Guantanamo, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, the thing is that the camps are not governed by a state. They are governed by the Syrian Defense Forces. There is not a state authority that, that a Dutch state can, can interface with. But that also means that there isn't anybody that can, the, the normal sort of guarantors of rights are not present in the camp, right? So, and this is something that I'm, I'm in terms of spaces of non-belonging, this to me is an ultimate space of non-belonging where, where um, the way the camp is legally organized makes it a space of non-belonging. And the logic of non-belonging is that these women are threats, that their children are potential threats. And ironically, the longer children are left there, the more likely they will be threats because they are growing up completely deprived of very fundamental, there's no education, there is not necessarily enough healthcare, there are so extraordinary amount, uh, percentage of death of preventable causes, there is violence in the camps there. Um, and we are leaving people there like right now, we're leaving children there without. And part of that I think has to do with ideas around custody very much in the sense that, um, so what France has decided is that they will repatriate children if women are willing to give up custody, right? Um, and the Dutch don't do that. They are more inclined to, when women come back, to partially remove custody and potentially return it when a woman has served a prison term, depending on some assessment of her status or potential to be recruited again or some such. But uh, I think parents' rights actually factor in this in really complex ways, is my sense. I don't know if that makes sense to you, Tamara, but because I think you're also always dealing with custody when you're talking about repatriation, whether it's just the children or the children and parents, you have to make a decision on how much uh, value you give to parents' rights and children's rights to parents, right? Which complicates things. Yeah, yeah it's... It's really sad and also really <laughs> and very fascinating, and that's the way that you, when you deal with academic material that is at the same time people's real lives really complex. Yeah.
Yeah. I started talking and I didn't even get your questions. <laughs> you know, in the, I think you answered it largely, but I, I, the women, maybe my question is the women without children. I don't want to call big on someone without children. I don't want yeah. to call someone whose children died. But like the women without children, uh, uh, are, is it even an option for them to come back? Like, or, or are the children some kind of... Uh, not, not, not a necessary but insufficient condition to even be considered for repatriation. It's a really interesting question. I don't know. I, I would be, I'd love to, I, yeah, with no, it's, it's also a lot of this information. It's not, it's not like you can just go to a database and these are the names of the women or whatever. It's very, like, the women without children are probably invisible. Yeah. There are some there without children, mm -hmm. um, but I know that anecdotally, really, from like some documentaries. That's the other thing. So states claim they cannot go to camps; it's too dangerous. And then there's all these documentaries about life in the camps. I'm like, so documentary filmmakers go there, journalists go there, people basically wander in and out. But then states have these like, well, we can't send our representatives there; it's dangerous. And mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> right? But it's. Yeah. You did. You've been waiting for a while. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm Blitz. I'm a PhD candidate in political science here. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. So thanks very much for an interesting talk. Uh, mostly for your interesting work. Um, I have two questions actually. I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, the first one I was really curious about uh, kind of the interaction between the media discourses and the state decisions. Mm -hmm. So from your talk, it seemed like the media discourses were quite stable in the sense that one person was considered undeserving or more deserving. Well, but I was wondering, uh, do you think that they also impacted the decisions taking these cases, or the other way around, that the mm -hmm. decisions taken mm -hmm. uh, made the media more like rationalized than yeah. specific race? So that was one question I was curious about. And the other, uh, because you started your talk saying that you think that uh, non belonging is conceptually very different from belonging. So I was wondering if you could elaborate this on. I'm so glad I got both of these questions recently in another talk. <laughs> Thank you. And clearly really important. Um, so not long first about it was me and then the link between state and, and media. I mean, Marlis, again, you, you've looked at both the parliamentary debates and the and so this I just want to share with you actually something that somebody observed. So well we thought we saw is that you see stuff in the media and then you see very similar frames in in Parliament, both British Hansard and Dutch. But then my cynical friend Audrey Macklin said, uh, I think those parliamentarians call the media in the morning to make sure that stuff's in being published, and then they recount it. So I was like, God, you're much more you're, you have a more <laughs> cynical mind. I was, I'm just too nice. Um, but it's hard to trace, right? It's really hard. And people work sort of more broadly. Some years ago, I decided to sort, of sort out, like, what do people think about the relationship between media and, and legislative action? And I have to say, I didn't look again. And I'm realizing that that might have been 15 years ago. So maybe people have come up with new things. But the... Um, as I understand it, but if you're working on this, tell me what you think, no, you don't, is that basically there's sort of a mutuality. There's conversations absolutely between media and legislators. They will, legislators will strategically use the media for agenda setting. So they'll float ideas, they'll get things. You also see this very clearly, Sherrod Willers was the master for many years at the, the pointed question for debate that would absolutely make the headlines, right? Um, so, and that's a use of the media to set an agenda. And then at the same time, publics, including the media itself, can also set the agenda and then push. So it's a, but it's very much a back and forth relationship. There is not a unidirectional relationship. It's very case and issue dependent. I guess because that was so broad when I learned at the time, I know I'm realizing that's why I didn't look at it because it just seemed all very logical and that sort of takes all the boxes of all the options. So it's a, um, Having said that, I just had a very interesting conversation with someone yesterday um, who basically said she feels that the media is very much an obstacle to repatriation because the way um, women are portrayed and also children, Marus was saying, are portrayed um, activates uh, 
securitization discourse activates a desire to be protected from, you know, bad actors. Who said that? Is that did I just quote George Bush? <laughs> um, and so, but when they when that doesn't get activated, then states are more inclined to actually follow already established legal principles, etc. So, in this case, um, it may be the case that um, media has a negative influence on these decisions. And one way I think we may be able to, because as social scientists, you can make these wonderful hypotheses. Well, where, how do you get your evidence? One of the interesting things is Germany, because we were kind of stumped. We know German women went to Syria. There's very little in the media. They are bringing more women home. So, you know, it's not fully evidence, like as in, you know, we, you know, but it's quite suggestive. So I'm hoping that we get to write sort of the absence of media discussion in Germany combined with a larger number of women repatriated. I'm suggesting at least that this hypothesis of media being an obstacle to enactment of women's rights. And then in that, um, also the idea that the media is, uh, as this person put it, lazy. <laughs> I hope there are no media people here. Um, in that they very much hew to a very simplistic narrative that does not take, and this is somebody who studies counterterrorism, um, it doesn't take into account all the ways that we actually have in our arsenal to de radicalize, we, we de radicalize, desist, etc. Um, and instead keep repeating these narratives as sort of very uh, um, dichotomous choices of like we will let somebody back and they're either going to commit an attack or they'll they won't but that's like it's, it's sort of a yes no and the risk is sort of then portrayed in that way that we tend to think of these yes no questions as 50 50 right where the actual risk is extremely extremely low um, but actual attacks committed by people coming back from Syria are very few And then non belong. God. <laughs> I see four hands. Okay. Yeah, it should be shorter. I'm being long. Um, do you have anything to add to this? Like, no, no. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, well, let me take some other questions and I'll get back to the non belong one because it is an interesting one, but I don't even know that I have a good answer for it yet. Hi, uh, Fabian. Uh, yeah. Fabian Holler. I have a PhD candidate in uh, in the food in the Department of Sociology. I work yeah. with LGBTQI uh, plus uh, queer refugees. Yeah. And we do co-creation uh, projects. Yes. Together. Yeah. And I was wondering. I hope I can phrase it because it's a bit, uh, but it's a little bit connected, I think, to what you're uh, asking. But uh, I think that you. It's really interesting. Thank you so much, by the way. Uh, you look at the yeah individuals, the two individuals, and the media discourse about this. So uh, and. Uh, making the analysis of how yeah, the, those uh, outcomes come. Uh, I was wondering if you can also say something from the society, so not from the individual, but does mm -hmm. the British and the Dutch society, like, is it any, like, can you say something about that? Like, what is the difference? Like, for example, if a Begum would be in the Dutch. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a big question, but I, I was just wondering, like, is, the, is it also mm. the political and the social structure of the society that makes the influence, you know, of Laura in the Netherlands getting a yes and making a yes? Actually, there is a paragraph in the in our conclusion of the long paper that, you know, you, you, you have a 10,000 word paper and then you turn it into a 6,000 word presentation, just cut, and that paragraph starts with, this is not the case of racist Britain and not racist Netherlands, mm -hmm. right? So I think that speaks to what you're saying. And what we basically argue is that uh, it's more like what is the, the word I used earlier, active, the, this idea of what gets active, what is available discursively and what gets activated. And in the case of Bingham, because she had the, so what actually happened with Bingham in 2015, so this is actually is empirically speaks to this question. When she first left, a lot of the reporting was much more about, she was a child, the home secretary at the time said, if she wants to come back, we will, we will you know, you know, welcome her and her friends. And that was being said um, well into like a year post her leaving. Um, 
So what you saw there was a narrative of a child who was duped, who was so young and it's so tragic. But when she is found and she is pregnant, she's an adult and she says these really stupid things. Like now, there's also, as the person I spoke with yesterday in an interview is clearly very on my mind, said, what is the ethical duty of a reporter? When you see a young woman who has lost two of her children, is it, now doesn't know where her husband is, whom she did actually have a, a relationship with, that was, as from what I can tell, who uh, is literally within 24 hours giving birth after having lost two children. Like this is really hard who is sitting on screen with two women next to her, monitoring what she's saying, right? And this journalist does not provide any of that context. So she says these things and it just becomes, at that point, she's almost a caricature of the ISIS terrorist, right? And that's what becomes sort of unovercomable. Had, I think with Laura H, it's, it's sort of the reverse. So is it because the, if, if we had had a Beckham in the Netherlands and she had had Moroccan citizenship and Rutte would have said, ah, bye bye, you know, because we have the 2017 law and we can now do that. I think, you know, we've had cases in the Netherlands. There was a, that revocation case, so maybe people in the room, uh, someone with Moroccan background of this 20, he, he sort of, was very marginally involved. He may have gone to Syria, I can't remember. But if he went, he came back very quickly as in like, oh my, this was the wrong decision, was tried, went to prison, rehabilitated, has a family, etc., and had a citizenship revoked because he went to Syria and everything that he did after that was suspect. So we have cases in both directions that show similar outcomes and, and so on. So I would say that it's, it's um, these cases happen to fall out this particular way in these two countries, but it's not because overall the Netherlands is so nice and Britain is so evil. They're both pretty evil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, maybe to follow up on that, yeah. I, think on this of um, I was wondering whether the, the legal context was still different. So now you, you started talking about it a bit, but in the introduction, I still had the impression that in Britain, can, there's much more leeway you know, to, to remove citizenship than in the Dutch case. So could this still, despite what yeah. you just said, still be one of the reasons for some different? Yes, for sure. I would say for sure. I, though I don't know because uh, when it comes to revoking citizenship of somebody in the Netherlands, there has to be a criminal conviction and that's not required in the UK. But with the UK, that clause, uh, you know, uh, conducive to the public good, is actually usually applied when people are abroad. So they can't appeal. Like that's really what the fight with Begum has been about. Her court cases have not been about the revocation. They've been about her right to be in Britain for her appeal, which has been denied based on secret evidence that Sajid Javid has and the judge knows and nobody else <laughs> knows. I, um, so given that the Dutch now since 2017 allow revocation without trial. I don't know what the burden of proof for those cases is. I need to read that report. I just, I got the numbers from it. I haven't read, so I don't know how much detail they're providing on the actual. Uh, my guess though is that the, the Brits are in general more, um, they do have the highest numbers and they are, and it, it sort of dovetails with the migration regime, the, the hostile environment, uh, now, this very, you know, I, it, because this is a, an area in which counterterrorism teams up with immigration law, because revocation is part of immigration law. And um, so criminal law is interfacing with uh, administrative. Yeah, administrative, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and that in Britain, they have kind of elaborated that even more than they are here, I think. So, so. Yeah, hi, Tessin Mohamed, from, also from the Australian First Night Amsterdam. I thank you so much for this. I really, really enjoyed uh, 
your talk and can't wait to read the paper once it's out. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about the role of religion because I feel that, so we, we talk about race and we talk about gender, but I feel that the obvious difference between these two cases is that one is from a Muslim family and the other one is a Dutch convert who, after she came back to the Netherlands, also immediately dropped her so Islamic faith. So I feel that there's also a securitization of the Muslim faith that plays into who is considered a terrorist threat and who is not. And I feel that you see that not only with the women, but also particularly with the parents of these women, right? So the father who brought Laura back is this hero who saves his daughter from this evil Muslim man. Um, but the Muslim families who have been trying to get their children back from ISIS territory have either been convicted for terrorism financing or uh, they have been uh, disappointed by the Dutch courts indeed when they ruled that there was no obligation to bring these families back. And they have never been described in the media as caring, loving parents who want to bring back their children, unlike the father of Laura. So I feel that the, the role of religion here also plays an important role in which Muslims are stigmatized um, yeah. as, you know, as inherently evil or suspicious or threatening. Yeah. Whereas uh, non-Muslim families or white families are are then reproduced as caring, loving, uh, yeah, innocent family relationships. No, absolutely. And I think I actually noticed it as I was reading it. I was like race, class, gender, religion, worship. Da, da, da. Um, having said that, I I shy away from calling it religion because. I see it much more as an anti-Muslim racism, right? So I see it as part of the process of racializing Muslim mm -hmm. immigrants because there's nothing, nothing's being said about the content of Islam, the practice of it as a religion. So in that sense, and maybe I'm too careful, but I, I always hesitate because I know very little about Islam as a religion. I always say, I don't, people will say, oh, you study Islam. I'm like, no, no, I study how Muslims are treated in not you know when they are a minority in these non-Muslim majority societies and the politics of that how that's gendered and racialized. So, but it's absolutely I completely agree with your everything you say though, like in the sense of and I'd love to read your work on on the the, the financing. Like I really hope you could send me some because that's um, because I and, and what you're saying about um, I was reading this book by uh, Mario van Sam. Uh, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, yeah, I, I think what the way in which families are portrayed, because she does a lot of work on the families, and I think she actually struggles. Of course, you're going to find families that aren't good families, but you also find families that are that care. And the other, the other part of it is that so many, also in the Netherlands, a fairly large proportion of people went are converts, right? So it's, it also, that also sits really in a, in a is, problem. Is that specific for the Netherlands or also? No, no I think it's, I don't, I'm not, like I'm, this is, I'm still new in this area. So sometimes I want to say things, I'm like, do I really know this? But my impression is that when it comes to things like joining ISIS and committing terrorist acts, it's more often than not people who aren't actually historically steeped in their faith, but much more likely people who've sort of discovered Islam and then get like turned into this corner of, of the practice that others, other Muslims might not even recognize as religious. It's, you know, I mean, the easiest thing I can say for people who are not familiar with that is to you know, imagine if you're Christian, if you are Christian, for example, but then you listen to some of those American fundamentalists and you just go, that has nothing to do with what I think or believe. And that's what people turn to them. Not all, again, not, not every convert, but it's just that, that sort of, it's, I think it's not just convert, not convert. It is actually that it's people who have a fairly minimal experience of engagement with the actual in-depth religious practice, which is quite elaborate, mm -hmm. text-based, requires study. <coughs> yeah. Um, hi, thank you for this talk. My name is Sonia from Austin. I'm a PhD candidate here at the Science Department. Um, 
Now the other day we had a really nice talk. Yes. Um, and we also discussed how the uh, role of Muslim and Islam is really changing in society. Yeah. I was wondering if you could reflect on how you think cases like Shino Gun and, uh, and Lara Hansen, how they will be discussed in the future. I mean, it's, you can't know, of course, but yeah. Maybe I should say a little bit about what we were talking about. Which is, um, the, uh, so I've been studying how Muslims are portrayed in the media for bleh, since 2004, 18 years with Kushner. Okay, so they've cycled through a whole bunch of these hot topics because of that, because that's where this comes up. And this was sort of the latest hot topic, but there aren't any sort of hot topics right now. We we're sort of in a, in a different space, but does that mean that we are sort of post-Muslim, anti-Muslim racism? Like, obviously not, right? So there's more of a, so what Sun and I were talking about is can you now say, when, when somebody now says, I'm for gender equality, that means something really different than 20 years ago. Right, so now we can talk the tropes that have been institutionalized through discussions of Muslims that bolstered a right wing politics with a splintering left. Like we're in a really weird time. Right? So we were talking about all these things all at the same time. <laughs> so are there, so these kinds of cases, um, which do come up briefly, do sort of activate an explicit, um, discussion of Islam in a, in that in that racializing racist lens, but they become it, it doesn't feel as active as it felt maybe ten years ago, five years ago even. So how do we then understand the current moment? That's what we were talking about. So it was more a question for us. Um, but this particular issue, I think, definitely, if you look at the. We, we were, Marlus just plowed through a bunch of the parliamentary discussions after women were, came back and just a few months ago. And, and it is one stereotype, it's, it's racist, it's misogynist, it's it, it, to the point of, it's almost, it's almost like people perform a caricature of an ultra-right politician. Like if, it, if you said, if you wrote it as fiction, Nobody would accept it because it would be so over the top. But it's being said out loud in Dutch Parliament, written down, committed to the Hansard, where it will stay for at least decades more unless something really terrible happens for life. Um, right? And my favorite, actually, a favorite, quote unquote favorite, one of the ones that I picked up, but I think it was Jan and Svinsa, where they said, these are, not, these are not women, they are terrorists. <laughs> and I, I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> like you don't even know where to start so that's um, but in general and it also came up in a conversation I was in uh, in Berlin last week um, this call is about uh, kind of the, the position of the Turkish community in Germany and how that has been like how post 2015 with the coming of many Syrians the million Syrians um, there's maybe a bit of a sense that Turks became German in that moment. Now, you know, speculative, but there is some signaling that some space is opened up differently. Um, but, that's, but that might be my next, my paper that I publish in three years or so. <laughs> My name is Nish Fripp, she edited the Great European Studies Department. I have a question, like, did you see any difference in how different media sources represented those cases? And also, I was uh, wondering also uh, how many cases in total you're planning to analyze. So this is, this is sort of our first, like, we're not going to go into cases yeah. again. Is, that's not the idea that the next paper that you might plan to write is on non belonging to answer that question, because we need to answer that. And then um, we're aiming to write a book that will actually do a really large, like one of those, take 100,000 media articles that reference Muslim women and see what changes have happened since 2000 to the present. We're using Python and scripts and things that I actually don't know how to do, but we have people. 
Um, and then uh, we want to talk about the camps as spaces of exception and kind of the logic that structures and that's probably going to be my next project. We're also talking to journal, we want to talk to journalists and documentary filmmakers and people who write these, these kinds of books to sort of what they see they're doing in their work. And then we're talking to uh, uh, mostly women from Muslim self-organizations to see how they are engaged with these, these topics. So the next, so these cases are really more, this was our point of entry and we're, we dug into them to kind of figure out what was going on. And we feel like we learned a lot, but we're not gonna do more cases. Now you were asking a, another question. So I'm telling about you about differences between- Oh yeah, between the media sources. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> in particular, I would say that <laughs> the Guardian was very uh, much more inclined to portray Beckham still as a, who once went as a child, and then uh, some of the times are more on the side of, of what we were presenting. Having said that, they're very much dichotomous images. So they still reinforce each other. They don't actually present an alternative interpretation. She's either like that, is she a willless victim or a wolf in sheep's clothing? The guardian would say, Begum is a willless victim, but it doesn't break the binary. So we didn't, um, we didn't go into sort of these oppositions per se for this, for this paper it might come up in that more in that larger media debate. Um, and then for the Netherlands, what did you think? Was there? Yeah, <clears throat> for NRSA, you got a lot of just very long pieces on Laura because Thomas wrote right, yeah. for them. Uh, probably more, yeah. No, and they still do. It's yeah. a podcast. I think. Yeah, it was a podcast. Now it's good. Um, we'll stop. He, yeah, so with, with more left wing, you kind of got a more dominant innocence message, but you still had some outliers, and also with the right wing, you had a more critical approach, but still the overarching message was more of innocence and victimhood. Um, but then in the more right wing papers, you saw more critiques, more questioning, and phrases like uh, what was victim, what was she exposing, stuff like that. Um, but overall, the general vibe was more towards the dominant mm -hmm. yeah. And also it shifts them. So the Wolf of Sheep's clothing is before the book is published when Laura is uh, Yeah, you also see a change at the time. And then once the book is published, the narrative is very much the book's narrative because they do the reviews and it's such an amazing book and it's so evocative. And they sort of rewrite the book in the short review mm -hmm. basically. So you get this repetition of that story. Yeah. So that's, but it, yeah, I think the Dutch media was actually more coherent overall with, yeah, like those more subtle differences. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it helps you to came up, I think, only in the yeah. in that day. Yeah, so you saw more of those like more racist, sexist, stereotypical tropes being used, mm -hmm. but not exclusively at all. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. This is really fun. Thank